Hi everyone, um, my name is Sally Lockyer. I'm Chief Exec of Surrey FA. Um, I'm delighted to have so many of you join us for this uh, Surrey FA exclusive webinar um, tonight. Fantastic to see so many coaches um, with us on, on, the, on the call. Um, just a couple of thank yous from me. Thanks to my team, James and Marcus, um, for organising this. Big thank you to Sporting Connect, who um, they're a new partner of ours at Surrey FA, coaching portal for jobs. So do go check them out as they load um, more opportunities for coaches. Um, and last but not least, a huge thank you to um, Peter for joining us tonight. And I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot about his uh, career um, and an insight, a unique insight into um, the, the value of coaching and how we can all um, take something from that. So I'll hand over to James, who'll take you through the session. Um, please enjoy. Thanks, Sally. Yeah. So just uh, just to sort of go through the technical bits, um, you should all have your, your mics muted. Um, if you could please just keep them that way, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, so basically the, the format is going to be, um, I will hand over to Rob shortly. Rob is from one of our commercial partners, Sporting Connect. Um, Rob, I think you might give a little bit of an overview on, on Sporting Connect as well. Um, and essentially we're going to sort of talk through Peter's career, um, weaving in some of the questions uh, that some of you have sent in to us. Um, if you do have any questions that kind of arise as we go through, please do do put them in the chat. Um, you know, if it's sort of relevant to what we're talking about, we'll we'll sort of fire it uh, straight at Peter. But otherwise, we'll we'll, we'll save those um, until the end, um, sort of around eight o'clock. Um, one other thing, I am conscious that it is the clap for carers, the last clap for carers at uh, eight o'clock tonight. So if we are looking like we're going to go past eight o'clock, uh, we'll what we'll do is we'll just take a brief. Uh, pause for a couple of minutes um, and those who want to sort of come back and join us um, after that can can obviously do so. Um, so yes I will hand over now to Rob and to Peter. Brilliant thanks James. Hi everyone. Um, yeah my name is Rob Lovesey and I'm the founder of uh, Sporting Connect. Uh, for those of you who don't know we're an online uh, network who aims to improve access to opportunities within uh, the professional game of football but also a grassroots level. Um, we essentially share some of the latest jobs in the professional game all in one place to save you time searching so you can focus on what you do best to coach. We're really proud to announce the launch of the recent partnership with the Surrey FA and we, we're striving to try and improve opportunity to grassroots opportunities within the county as well. Um, Sally mentioned we're really fortunate to have Peter here today. So we're going to, we've got over 100 coaches that are attending this session across all levels. Um, and from a coach, an amateur coach like myself, um, and also a sort of failed amateur footballer, um, even 20 years ago, we probably didn't have access to this kind, these kind of opportunities and this kind of advice and scope from someone like Peter today. But hopefully everyone can take something away, whether they're going to learn and improve themselves as a, as a coach, or be able to have a few takeaways to try and improve you know, the, the players or the clubs that you coach at. So tonight's going to be a really conversational sort of piece between myself and Peter. Um, we've had questions that have been submitted in from coaches over the last week, and we've tried to integrate those throughout the conversation. So your specific question, we're not, we're not going to name anyone, but you'll probably see when it's been highlighted. Um, and then there's also going to be a bit of time at the end just for any other questions that come in or that we may have missed. So, um, yeah, over to Peter. Um, it's going to be a great opportunity to learn your story, and thanks for attending. Um, obviously, you're quite unique in your role from going from the very grassroots football straight well, to the, to the professional game, the very highest pinnacle of the game within England. So, yeah, over to you, Peter. Hello there. Good evening to everyone. And uh, as Rob said, um, hopefully, um, hopefully it turns out that somebody gets something out of, of it tonight. Um, I've always regarded myself as a, as a coach that tries to improve people. Uh, and if it means that one or two of you get a little bit out of tonight that's going to push you on a little bit further in in a, in a certain area, then I'd be delighted. So I think Rob, first of all, wanted me to talk about how I started. Well, I was a professional footballer from 69 to 82. Uh, again, all different levels, uh, you know, League One, League Twos, Championships uh, and, uh, and Premiership, as they call it now. Uh, which again was uh, was you know a very very good experience for me, uh, and I've had exactly the same as as a coach and as a manager. I've I've been at all all the levels, 
uh, and again at international level, which is which was also fantastic. Uh, and there's all good experiences uh, from from all of them. When I was 17 years of age, believe it or not, I ran a Sunday morning football team. So I was playing uh, as an j just turned professional at South and United. Uh, and I, I ran a Sunday morning team and I actually run Sunday morning teams for 16 years. So mm. it just means I think I knew I was going to be a coach. Uh, I do say to players um, and, and it means I'm, I'm guilty of this, to be fair. I do say to players, don't let anything get in your way. Give yourself every chance to be a success at one of the best jobs you could possibly have. And then I look at myself and I was running Sunday morning teams um, thinking about Sunday morning teams rather than thinking about how I'm going to play on the Saturday before that, which, which was wrong. Uh, but, but again, I had uh, tremendous experiences. Um, I trained, as I say, when I could with a Sunday morning team because it wasn't like a twice a week uh, situation. Uh, but eventually in 1986, uh, I got my first Saturday job, which was at Dartford Football Club. Had four years there. It was the first time where the player as would get a little payment for playing uh, and it was the first time where you'd have a regular training sessions it was only three times a week but it was something that uh, you had to do uh, or wanted to do and then you, you sometimes you'd have a good training pitch to train on sometimes you'd have the edge of the pitch because of the conditions were poor and you had to adjust and uh, that's that's how it was uh, after four years at Dartford which was a very good successful four years uh, I went to Enfield uh, and I know that's what they're talking about tonight is Enfield to England. And Enfield was a cracking year. Worked with Paul Furlong, which some of you might have heard of, because after that um, he went to Coventry. And then uh, after my one year at Enfield, uh, I went to Watford as assistant manager and we bought Paul and he was a, he was a tremendous uh, success. Um, after that, as I say, after Enfield, I had a lucky break uh, because Peter Shrees who used to be assistant manager at Tottenham at, um, at Watford with Steve Perriman and, and Peter went to Tottenham, which meant that Steve needed a, an assistant manager. And I was very fortunate enough to get that phone call to go there to go to Watford. And that started me off on the professional side. Um, so I think that's Rob. I think that's all I really wanted to say. After that, of course, I've got, you know, the. I started at South End as a, as a league manager. Then I get the opportunity with the under 21s, and it goes from there. And uh, so I'm happy to talk as as much as you like. But hopefully, certain people would would know that, and they they get a bit bored. Yeah, no, that gives some great context. I appreciate that, Peter. In terms of one of the questions that arose from a lot of the coaches were um, those aspiring coaches that are looking for that career advice. So I guess what are the the snippets or tips that you take out from your career and your progression that you could kind of pass on to any sort of aspiring coach at the moment? Well, I was, I was very lucky. I was very lucky because I played uh, all different levels, which meant I, I was always um, with a lot, lot of good football people. So I had good football contacts. So in that respect, you do need that little bit of luck. And, and all I would say to any coach now is work as hard as you possibly can to get as lucky as you can. You know, that's, that's how I see it. Now, if I was a coach now, I would make sure that I saw as many coaching sessions as I possibly could all over the place. If you could afford to go abroad, go abroad. If you could afford to, you know, just get in a car and drive a long, long way to go and watch a good coach work, I would always, there would be so many benefits of that. And it doesn't mean that the coaches of those sessions have got things 100% right either. I think that if you could, you could, uh, all, all of us go to watch a training session and we would change certain things with certain things you like, certain things you don't like. Uh, but that's what I would do. I would, I would go and watch academy uh, coaching. I would, I would try and have meetings with the academy directors. I would offer to go and do work uh, to, for nothing. I would, uh, I would try to get individuals um, doing. You know, I think that you, I used to take, believe it or not, uh, I used to take Danny Webb, uh, who is David Webb's son who was a famous old Chelsea player and, and manager. Uh, and I used to take him for 40 minutes in a, in a squash court with a football. Uh, and the things that you have to keep doing to explain, it then I've helped you become, a, I think, a decent coach, the way that you explain things, of the way that you're kicking the ball, what side of the football are you kicking, and little things like that. Uh, so there's, there's, there are lots of things where you can make yourself busy and you make yourself improve. Uh, of course, if you can get hold of a team, 
uh, uh, being allowed to go and coach them, that's really going to help. The younger the group at times, I think it's more beneficial because the younger ones need more help. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to let them play football, but it, it means that you can help them and coach them. So if you get the opportunity to manage uh, or coach Barcelona tomorrow, you won't be saying too much in the tra in the training session. But if you're taking a, an under-12 team, you'll be saying a lot and you'll be getting used to your voice. Uh, Peter, what, what, what are some of the challenges we see from coaches that we work with quite a lot are obviously they, they're not fortunate enough to be ex-players themselves or be yeah. connected within the professional game. So my question to you would be, obviously, as a, as, a, as a coach, as a manager in the professional game, what would coaches have to do to get your attention and to try and make, you know, get the attention of people that are those decision makers? Well, all I would say there is that I, I've, I've been a manager a long time, uh, lots of different clubs, and I always respect letters that come in from people or phone calls that come in direct from people. So I would say to coaches, don't be afraid about that. You know, I, as I said earlier, I was lucky that I, I, I had a decent career and I knew a lot of football people. Um, but again, I've had letters. I've had letters when I was managing, again, different levels from people that wanted to come in, A, to watch training. Uh, that would be the first thing. Then all of a sudden you get to meet uh, the, the, the coach or the manager. Then all of a sudden you could hopefully try to build up a relationship. And then all of a sudden, then you might get the opportunity that if something crops up, all of a sudden the under 10s or under 12s or under 16s are looking for a coach. You know, could I come in and do a couple of sessions that you can have a look at me? I, I wouldn't be afraid to put my to put myself forward because I certain you know if, if managers are like me, I think they quite respect that that somebody's willing to have a go. Okay, no, and that, that's just I guess that's just one of the challenges that we we sort of get feedback on a regular basis from the coaches we work with. But um, what other I guess particular challenges did you face in terms of your your sort of coaching journey? Um, well, as far as challenges, as I say, you know, I I started off low as because it, it was a Sunday morning team, you know, and I'd done three different teams in, in 16 years. So then there wasn't too much coaching there because it was a Sunday morning team. Eventually, then I go to uh, Dartford, which is a Saturday team. And then you've then got to organise your sessions. Then you've got to organise your match uh, preparation and so on. I, I am a non-stop writer downer. <laughs> I, I would really say to people, if they think of anything, please write it down. Don't ever forget it. Uh, and that's how I, that's how I've been. So if it means that I'm at Dartford and we're training on a Tuesday night and we're playing against a team that are poor at set pieces, then we will have a set piece week that week. Uh, uh, and, and that's how the planning went. And I suppose, you know, I'm now, of course, much, much older. So over the years, the experience has come in ongoing things like that or doing things like that in terms of obviously that that progression when you hit those challenges and you continue to progress how much did you have to adapt to your coaching style or what was the biggest change i guess as you progressed up the levels was it you as a coach was it the players you're working with um was it a combination of all of them all of those things well uh, again uh, again on the coaching uh, i'm sure there's lots of coaches listening tonight that feel as though they've got to make every session different and every session interesting. Uh, I, I would have to disagree with that, to be honest with you, because I think there's times where, depending on the level of player that you're taking, you might have to spend the week. OK, we're talking about me working for a week. You know, so you know, th this is an example. I know there'll be certain coaches out there that are only doing once or, or twice a week or whatever. Uh, but, there's, but to me, there'd be times, even if it was now at Dartford, um, and I would then be saying, right, the level of how much these players can take, I'm not going to keep chopping and changing the training session. So it might be it might be six sessions or over three weeks of crossing and finishing or where I, where I want the crosses to go, where I do not want the crosses to go and so on, rather than then say, right, we've got to have crossing today and we've done crossing Tuesday, let's not do crossing Thursday. I'm not convinced that's the right thing to do. I think to drum it into the people that you're you're working with, then I think it's important that you get the point. The higher the higher the player is, is nine times out of ten more intelligent as well. And I can honestly say to you that uh, in, before the '98 World Cup, uh, Glenn Hoddle asked me to take the England B team to have a look at three or four 
uh, groups of players before the World Cup, so, so Glenn would make his final preparation. I could tell the difference of one training session where I asked down there, in crossing and finishing, I believe there's areas to hit, hit where you shouldn't even have to see if somebody's in there. And I put this point over to Darren Anderson, who, who when we played Russia the next night at Loftus Road, all of a sudden he's grabbed it. Now, if you'd have been taking maybe a League Two player, you'd have had to keep on to him and on to him and on to him to do it. So that's all I'm saying to you is depending what level, there's a fair chance you wouldn't have to say, you wouldn't have to repeat yourself too much. But if it's a lower level, don't be afraid to keep on to them and on to them and on to them until they finally get it. A repetition. And obviously, being an amateur coach myself, I'm quite, you know, I'm into the tactics, but it's hard to sometimes motivate and engage the players to make sure they enjoy their football. But at the same time, they take that side of the planning and preparation quite serious. I mean, from your experience, how would you kind of look to get that balance, really? Um, well, I think you've got uh, you, you've got to be honest with them to say that people have got a train right to to show the manager, show the coach that he deserves to be playing in the first team or, or whatever team it is. Um, I think um, I think you know. Oh, hang on, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a you know that's a very very important part for me is that that. Um, just speak, say again, Rob, I, I missed that bit. So it was, it was just the balance between how much of your session you'd be focusing basically on tactics and planning yeah. and yeah. how much in terms of on-the-ball stuff actually enjoying. Because, you know, it's like yeah. when you try and get guys to work on shape and they're turning around to you saying, oh, come on, can we just not get on the ball and just, you know, have a kick around and enjoy our football? Yeah. How do you try and get that balance between the two? I know it's different within the professional game because people are paid and that's their job. However, within amateur football, how would you try and expect people to... To have that balance as a coach. Yeah, well, but again, uh, but again, as you as a coach, if you're if you're putting on that session, you're putting that on for the right reason. And I think that you've got to get you've got to get the bits and pieces out of the players that you you need out of that session. And even if it means uh, there's times of that session that will be enjoyable, but for 20 minutes, lads or wh whoever you're ta taking. Uh, for 20 minutes, this is not going to be enjoyable, but it's going to be very important. It's going to help us for our next match day. So I think that you've got to get a little balance like that. Terry Venables, uh, I had as a coach when I was at Crystal Palace as a player. Uh, he was fantastic in the respect that they were really fun, his sessions. But he really said to people, right, this next 10 minutes is not going to be fun, but you make sure you concentrate. Otherwise, we won't have fun at the end of the end of the session. And that's how he was. So I think there are important points. Set pieces are not fun to take. Set pieces are boring. But as everybody knows, how many times are you, you score or you concede from set pieces that uh, you hopefully worked on? And if you've conceded, you haven't worked on. OK, nice. No, that's, no, that's, a, that's a good one because that was a question that did come in from one of the fellow coaches as well. Another one was, um, have you seen, as you progress through your managerial career, a change in the shift in the type of players that you're working with? Are you seeing now more natural athletes that are then nurtured into becoming, you know, quality professional footballers or or vice versa? Um, well, I think there's there's definitely... They're definitely fitter players now. There's definitely that, you know, you get more looked after now. And if you if you don't achieve your fitness levels now, you're 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 silly, really, because you, the, the the staff that most people have got, you know, uh, uh, or you can turn to now. OK, you talk about the top teams, but even if you're not a top team, you can turn to a fitness coach that can help you. Uh, so if you don't take on board the things that they're giving you, uh, then you you know you you're not giving yourself every chance to be a success. There's no doubt about it. The players, the teams are fitter these days. Uh, they have to run around even more at times. And is and now with the rule of the goalkeeper not picking the ball up, the game keeps going longer. Uh, or you know never stops. So you have to be fitter. Uh, so again, uh, people would be crazy. I think not to not to have take, taken things like that on board. Um, very different, I think, on the football defensively these days than when I played. I'm sure when I was a winger, 
I had to worry about an, uh, one opponent. Now they show you inside, they show you outside, they double bank you. You have to think, you have to think ahead of that. And there's times you've got to be a clever footballer. That if all of a sudden there's two defenders uh, defending against you, that's when you've got to pass it, and that's where everybody's got to learn that game. Now that's sort of leading quite nicely to. Um, we had quite a few questions on talent identification as well. And as a coach, as a manager, what would you be looking for in a young player that's emerging as some of the main traits that you look out for to sort of think, right, well, I can actually take them to the next level and really progress? Um, well, I think I think I think you'd, you'd have your scouting network for a start, and your scouts have got to know. Uh, the type of team that you want to play, and the type of shape you want to play, and the type of fullback you want. Do you want a wing back? Do you want a do you want a, a fullback? Do you want uh, a very attacking fullback playing in a four? All little things, things like that. Um, and I think then that gives you a chance of them of them going out on the on the road to identify certain players, uh, and that's the type of thing that you want. Of course, you want very fit athletes these days, uh, but I suppose, you know, all teams haven't all got completely fit athletes. There's, there's a little blend, a little balance in the team. And uh, so, uh, again, I, I think that you, you, you know, your scout should know really the type of things that you're looking for. And um, another question that did come in prior to the session was best piece of advice that you've been given or would give um, that could be applied to coaching young or developing amateur footballers? Amateur footballers? Um mm -hmm. Well, I think the only advice I could probably give to, to any coaches or anything out there is be yourself for a start. You know, just be yourself. Don't try and be, don't try and be somebody else. Uh, I would say that you've got to try and improve people. Uh, if I was taking younger players these days, I would be, uh, if they had an hour session with me, there'd be more than a half an hour playing football. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There'd be less time that I'd be talking, giving them stuff. I'd be giving them some basic stuff. But I, I really wouldn't want to see academy teams coach, uh, playing, training, uh, where they probably get 10 minutes of football at the end and the coach has done all the talking for 50 minutes. So I think that's not good for the player, for the young player's development. I think it's good for them to keep playing, learn by their mistakes and keep improving. Um when I was when I was ten years of age, I think it'd be ten years of age. I used to drive my mates mad by going over a local wreck. Wreck. I built two goals, uh, and I had two two against two football, three against three football with a tennis ball. And to me, that was all about running with the ball, defending without the ball. And and so small sided games all of a sudden come into it now, where of course they they reduce the size of the of the pitch. And all of a sudden, that's happening with seven asides, eight asides, and so on. It means you get more touches, you you improve even more. Um, one thing I would say to the coaches is that, and it's probably not just football, it's probably everything of, of a manager or whatever, is that um, I have to cut down the years now because I'm 67. You know, I used to say this to people when I was 50. And I used to say, my dream is when I'm walking at the other side of the high street, players that I've had before walk across that road to come and say hello. So I said, in 20 years' time, I want to see that. I can't say that now because I'm getting, I'm getting on the touch. Mm -hmm. But that, to me, is the type of thing that I look at myself and the way that I've worked. I've tried to improve the players. Now, even if a player, uh, over the time that I've had him, uh, has not, you know, not liked me for some reason, I'd still expect him to cross that high street road to then come and say hello because he knows I tried hard to make him a better player. And I think that's the thing I would be saying to myself as a coach. What can you do to make them a better player? So just take, just take, give them a little bit of care. Uh, think about their, their, you know, what they're good at, what they're not good at, what they need as the position that they're going to play at, and set their set their training sessions to that. How do you try and get a young player like that then to kind of take ownership of their own development? So I guess there's only a certain amount you can do as a coach or manager. But really, in an ideal world, you want them to try and fulfil their potential to the best of their ability. So have you got any examples of like when you worked maybe at under-21s or even at, at, within youth football, how you got players to sort of empower them to take ownership? Well, Rob, I was very lucky. You know, you, 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 you're taking the England under-21s and you've got a group of players there that are desperate to do well because they want to get to the senior team. So there's not going to be many people that are not going to try hard for a start. 
Now, all I'm going to be doing then is to to each individual, you know, James Milner, for instance, you could not meet a better professional. Now, James Milner's, if anything, his final bit wasn't right. So, so little things like that with James, his final end product, the final cross at times, he let himself down, but everything else, he was, he was fantastic, fantastic. So, so that, that, there's just little points I think you can say to individuals, you know, can, ha, you know, how, how's your crossing? Why, why are you crossing? You know, why is too many going behind the goal? Is it because you're not, you're not, you're not getting too much of the, or too, too, too less of the ball or too much of the ball? You're doing something wrong there. So there's little things there that you can just be talking to individuals on certain positions. And, you know, there's, there's loads. The centre halves getting too tight, trying too hard, trying to win every, every header, all little things like that. So, but you've got to, I suppose, get a meeting with the individual. And get an agreement with him because there's no point you telling him if for some reason he doesn't agree with you. Because I think you, you, I think you've got to get that agreed that you know ideally you want him to look you in the eyes to say yeah I agree with that. Let, let's let, let's keep working at that. That's cool, Brian. Uh, we had quite a few coaches that are obviously um, coaching coaching kids of, of all levels. Um, one specific question came in around like under nine, under ten, under eleven level. If you do have talented kids you're working with, how can you really help them ensure that they fulfil their potential? I think you pretty much answered that in a prior question. And it's about, I guess, getting that balance of enjoying it, playing football, but also help, helping them where you can. Um, well, I, I think that if I was taking an under 10 now who looked as though he had bags of potential... Um, I'd make sure that I kept his feet on the ground for a start and I'd make sure that I kept telling them how good he could be and, I, and I'd keep saying the words could. Uh, so, you know, because there's been, there's, you know, there's still been players that have got to England under 21 level and then not kicked on because they haven't pushed their career. They, they think all of a sudden they've, they've cracked it, they've relaxed too early. Uh, and then they haven't pushed on, and there's so much competition out there. That's what you got to do. So I think there's, I, I think there's, th there's players out there, Rob. These days, I know, unfortunately, because of the problem we have currently, there's not lots of football on the television. But to me, when football's on the television, uh, and there's games going on every weekend, you can easily say to a boy, a girl, uh, look, have a look at, look, look, have a look at what movement he's got, and and, and so on. Uh, so I, I think there's areas there that you can you can again agree with somebody and you've got it you've got it in front of you so to show what could, what can be done. Yeah, no, no, no that's, yeah, that's useful. Someone else mentioned about um, for the submitted a question. It's quite topical actually because I think it was Mental Health Week last week, but dealing with players that suffer from anxiety um, that are kind of hindering their performance and throughout your career, I guess, have you experienced it working with individuals? Uh, suffering and if if so any advice you can help coaches to overcome this well i think i spoke to you yesterday and said that i'm pleased to say that i don't think i have had uh, these experiences in my career with with players that i've played alongside or or worked with um but you know again the only thing i would say these days there's so much more help these days than there's ever been uh, and uh I hope if anybody has got a problem there that they want to use their voice and they want to speak to people because there's people that are really, really happy to to listen. Uh, you know, people understand it's correct as well. What, what's going on? It's not it's not nice. And people want to help. And uh, so uh, people really should open up as much as they can. It's easy for me to say that because I haven't had a, had a problem. But, you know, just that uh, what is out there now with the help that the FAs give then I think people, if they can, you know, call somebody up to try and get some kind of help. Yeah, no, that's an important takeaway. Um, in terms of uh, someone asked, posed an interesting question about the coach education provided by the FA compared to other leading football countries. So obviously we know, I was lucky enough to see your bio and um, you, you managed Bahrain recently. And it was quite interesting to, to get a comparison between you know, emerging nations like that in terms of football and how they compare to what the FA is doing? Um, well, again, uh, there's, you know, when I was out in Bahrain, I was there for nearly two years. Um, they are football crazy. They are English football crazy. Uh, and they're learning all the time. And uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see some of the, the uh, academies for the teams. There's about 12 professional teams out there in, in the top league. 
uh, but they all had they all had their their, their uh, the boys and girls training, uh, and and it was good. It was very very good to see. Uh, and I think the nice thing about that teams like or countries like Bahrain are are also going younger and younger. When I first went to Bahrain, the team were really old. And then all of a sudden, I got it changed, and we, I swapped over the, the Olympic team. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, a lot of teams now are younger and younger, and they're giving the youth a chance, and they're doing it right. And uh, I think pl teams now, uh, players now, uh, are getting the right education to improve the game. And uh, so, I think in, you know, English football 25 years ago, that wasn't the case. But I think now it's 10 times more organised. And I think it's nice now that if you're a certain position, you've got to be doing certain things in that week to to help your position. Uh, so, I think the the way it's organised now is is really good. So, if you so obviously if you're an aspiring coach, then and you're looking for further opportunities. How we know it's so competitive within the English game. Should people be considering opportunities overseas? Any particular countries that stand out for you, or even like women's football, the, the women's football? Because we see a lot of opportunities arise within the women's game, which could be a good entry route. Yeah, well, I, I, I think one of the problems are is that there's probably less and less jobs, Rob. That's the problem, you know. So, you know, you could try. You could always, of course, write to uh, other countries. Uh, and to see if there's opportunities, but you're still going to have to have some kind of background for, for some, you know, I can only take Bahrain as an example. You know, if they got a letter from a coach in England, uh, they would still would have to have some kind of background to where they've been coaching and so on. Uh, otherwise, they would give that to a Bahraini coach. That's what they would do. Uh, so um, that's where people do need that lucky break, you know, and I do feel for people that there might be less less jobs now. Uh, you know, I've, unfortunately, we might have more uh, jobs, but not a much to, you know, to the English coaches or the, uh, the, the British coaches. And, and that's that's disappointing. Uh, but really, as I say, you, I think they've just got to work as hard as they possibly can to try and get that lucky break. And no matter where it is, you know, I, I you know, hopefully the ladies won't mind me saying this, but there'd be, there'd be men out there that may be thinking, I may not want to run a ladies team. But I would say that's a good thing anyway. Go and run a ladies team. You know, I, I look at that. Everything is done correctly. That's getting bigger and better. Uh, and if you get an opportunity to be coaching in football, then it's the game of football. Yeah. Yeah, because that is that it is so competitive. So I think people do seriously need to look at these different opportunities. Something else I'll I'll say to you, to you, Peter, in terms of your view, some of the opportunities we see, the salaries and the the hourly rates are just some of them are just not competitive at all. So for, for coaches to to make that jump into sort of progressing their career seriously, they've got to sort of sacrifice quite a lot of times. And I guess it's a balancing act when you've got family, you've got responsibilities. So I guess anyone in that position that's thinking about making that jump, any advice you could give to them at all? Um, well, I, I, I think the, I joined Watford. I joined Watford in 91 and I completely split my salary by half. Uh, I had I still have, thankfully, two daughters. Both were having tennis lessons at that time. Uh, and I was at uh, I was at Enfield. And I was working for Standard Life Assurance Company and, uh, and I was doing OK. And then all of a sudden I wanted the opportunity to go and work at Watford because I wanted to be a professional football manager, coach, whatever. Uh, so I decided to take that 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 drop. Uh, and it was hard for my family at that time. Uh, but in the end, it's turned out to be a good result. So it's really people have got to you know, balance on whatever they can do and want to do. You know, I think in life, um, you know, I'd love people to be working and doing what they want to do. Uh, and I think we all, we all feel that way. Uh, but uh, that can't always be financially the way you can do it. But if there's ever an opportunity to join the football side of it, then if it means you've got to take a cut and drop your standards a touch, it might be worth it. Might be. Mm, yeah, so yeah, so you've got to weigh up and make sure the balance is right for you. For you, I guess. Yeah, um, it's just it's just a shame that the, it's just a shame that there are less and less jobs available. But as I say, I, I think that um, you know, if people are very very serious, that they want to be a coach. They've got to you know be ahead of the game, I suppose, and, and and get in front of the right people 
and keep thinking on who should I get who should I get in front with? How, how can I how can I end up taking a training session on Thursday night to to let them know what I can do? So you so in a way you've got to kind of create to do your own bit to create those opportunities, I guess, make your own bit of luck. Yeah, well I well I think so. As I say, you know, you write you write to a football manager, can I come and watch training? Then all of a sudden, as I say to you, you 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 meet somebody there and it just goes from there. Now it may not develop into anything, but if you're giving yourself a chance, then I think then you'd be you'd be happier that you give it a go. Did you have any bits of luck that stand out throughout your career? Really well, my, bits, my, bits of, my bits of luck was Glenn Hoddle, of course. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Hoddle was a teammate of mine at Tottenham, but Glenn Hoddle was a very, very serious football person, and he would only take on people that he knows that, that, that would do a good job, that A, trust and do, do a good job. I'd done a little bit of work for Glenn. In, in one of his first jobs, he was manager of Swindon Town, and I'd done a little bit of work for him. And I showed him, I suppose, what I could do. Uh, now, he knew me as a person, so that was my that was my bit of luck. But then as soon as he then gets the England job in 96, that's when he asked me to be the under-21 manager because he knew the type of things that I wanted to coach and he knew how I, how I got on with players. He knew I still had a very young brain uh, that would mix him with, with the players. And that was my bit of luck. And uh, But, you know, I can assure you... Um, if I'd have been no good at what I was doing uh, and wouldn't have got on with the players, then Glenn wouldn't have took me on. And then, but, but that, but, but you know, as I say, that's that, that's where there is luck involved, and that's where I was lucky that I had the, the football career. Yeah. On talking uh, former England managers as well, there was an interesting quote on your bio that you sent over from Sir Bobby, and he quoted that Peter's great. He knows how to build a team and win without spending money. Now. Um, that's obviously going to be quite relevant to a lot of the coaches, no doubt, on this call because we're not for the luxury of budgets and we've got to work with the players that we've got. Um, we've talked a bit about getting the best out of players, but I guess and takeaways for the coaches on this call, when you're working with that team, when you're working those individuals, how do you as an individual sort of motivate to get the best out of them um, and work well, with them? Again, again there with with uh, the, the really nice uh, comments from, from Sir Bobby Robson. Um and of course, I treasure. I'm very proud of things like that because what a, what a what a man he was. And um, and and I think that I think what what Sir Bobby meant is that he knew that I was willing to work as hard as I possibly could to make the team as organised as it could possibly be. Uh, and I think that's all I would say to any coach out there, no matter what level you're coaching at. Um, do your you know be 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 happy with what you've done in, in your session. Uh, Get get your session organised in a in a in a in a way that you want to get your points over. Uh, so if it's an attacking session or a defending session, make sure you a a a you want to do that. B you want to do that. C you want to do that. Okay, the older you get, you won't have to do that so much, you know. But when you're starting off, you make sure you get those most important points over in that training session. Uh, and I think that, that that's the type of thing that I, you know, if I'm managing Leicester City. Uh, which was there was good times and also some bad times there, but we still uh, I think was as organised as we possibly could be, and I think that's what Sir Bobby would have would have meant. And when it comes to organising, do you have any recommendations in terms of structuring, you know, your your week with the players, or um, in terms of you said about focusing on set pieces? Would you say you know twenty percent of my time should be focusing on set 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 pieces or other areas? Do you do you look at it from that perspective or not? Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I would always have a very um, organised week in the respect of um, knowing I'm going to be doing two defending sessions. So there'll be two defending days uh, and there'll be definitely two attacking days and there'll be other things like maybe more individual work and, and so on. Um, set pieces, mega, mega important. Um, not only, you know, uh, again, Steve Perriman, who's a very good friend of mine, was assistant manager at Tottenham with Aussie Idealists. And, and I said, Steve, you're still doing set pieces? He said, no, we're not doing really a lot of set pieces. Uh, Ozzy just wants you to play off the cuff and all things like that, which was fantastic. And he's, you know, Ozzy was you know, a very attractive, not only player, but manager. His teams are very great to watch. But it, I said to Stevie, that makes me nervous, Steve, that you're going to concede. Because if you don't practice set pieces to score them, it means you're not going to practice them defending them. Uh, so I think that uh, you know little things like that are are very very important. And uh, to me, most of the players they might have known roughly what they're going to be doing in the week, but in some ways 
uh, that's not a bad thing either. You know, they might know, right, well, Thursday is going to be a really hard defending morning. Uh, 11 against nine, as if, you, you know, as if we're, we're one light and we're always under the cosh. That's the type of thing that we always do. Um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, I think it is important to have um, a reason to do that session. Uh, I think your players have got to understand the, the session uh, and they have half got to know why you're doing it. Um, and I think, I think, yeah, I think they've got to know the, the benefits. They've got to know the benefits of it. And, uh, and I think it's very, very important that uh, they know what they're doing. Yeah, and in terms of those different sessions that you had, how much repetition was there? You said earlier, like, the lower down the football pyramid, the more you had to repeat different things to get the message across. Now, did you have a set um, amount of sessions that you just repeated on a regular basis, or did you continually add variety? Or Yeah, no, the, high, the higher the level uh, tests, tests me more on the sessions given. Uh, so, in other words, I've got to make sure, because... When you're managing some of these top players, they're the players which the coaches might be surprised. I'm going to say this, but they're the ones that say, "Well, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this?" You know. Now, a League One player, a League Two player, National League player probably wouldn't be doing that. They'll just get on with it, you know. Uh, but the higher the level, a lot of them want to know why we're doing it, and uh, so so that's where you've got to be sure. Now. Training sessions, then you could be doing a keep ball session for a player's awareness of things around him, you know. Uh, and so, so you can chop and change and make that more in interesting for the top players, you know. Now there'd be there'd be ones there, league ones, league two. You could give them the same thing all the time, uh, and that that that's what you might that's what you have to do to improve them. Uh, but the higher the level, you you I think you have got to make it more interesting because they are the ones that could be a touch more. Um, they might get fed up a little bit quicker, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, so that is more of a test for the coach. So something to take away, the lower the level effectively, what you're saying is don't worry, don't put too much pressure on you as a coach to come up with the variety and make every session really interesting. You might be better off actually just having a few sessions up your sleeve and doing them really, really well, repeating them to improve the players. 100%. On, honestly, that, that's what I'd be saying now. So if I'm if I'm managing Leicester City, it's the thing that the, what, I, what we spoke about earlier. If I'm managing Dagenham and Redbridge, it'd be more a case of, right, chaps, we've got to do this Monday. We're going to have to spend another 15 minutes on Tuesday and keep on to them all the time about, about you know, to keep it in their heads of what you want them to do in a certain situation in a match. Uh, and there's still, there still will be problems uh, that will crop up. Uh, but I think that's the way to do it. As I say, top players, one session is probably enough, you know, and, and then you'd probably repeat that session, you know, two weeks' time or whatever. Uh, lower the level, definitely two or three times in a week. Yeah, no, excellent. that's interesting. Um, I think I'll hand over to James at this point. Um, I've tried to include a lot of the questions that came in from the fellow, fellow coaches on the, on the call. Apologies if I can include your question right now. Um, James, was, is there any questions that have been submitted on the chat by the um, whilst we were chatting there? I haven't seen any come through, but if anyone does have any questions, um, we've, we've probably got about 15 minutes or so maybe to, to go through some of those. Um, so please do yeah. use the opportunity. Yeah, to fire, some fire, fire some questions in, that'd be great. But Peter, someone did ask, would you see yourself as a coach or a manager? Manager. Manager. Man a uh, manager that distinction. Uh, uh, oh yeah, without a doubt. But but don't get me wrong. Um, a manager that th there's different managers out there. There's different types. I'm a, I'm a manager that coaches, uh, but I still wanna I still wanna be taking those important sessions. You know, I think it's more important to be a ma uh, the, the, a coach and a manager later in the week before closer to the games. Very you know, very Monday's not important. Tuesday's probably not important. When it gets to Thursday and Friday, it's very important that the players uh, have the manager taking the major sessions. In my in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank and you. I did ask as well about peaking as a coach. When do you feel you peaked? Have you peaked? I said to you earlier, 20 years ago today is the anniversary of Gillingham beating Wigan in the playoff final. So that was, uh, I definitely peaked then, to be fair. 
But uh, mm-hmm. no, after 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 any win is is a, um, I would say to the coaches and managers out there that they would know they would know how you feel that if you win a match, you feel ten times better than than any player. If you lose a match, you feel ten times worse because it's your team and and things have not gone gone well. You really do take it personally. I've always found it extremely hard to go and clap the crowd. Uh, after a performance where we've got beat, you know, because I'm really annoyed at myself or uh, the way things have gone. Um, but as far as peaking, I, I think it's it's uh, it, it's just really how you feel in yourself uh, that you look at the game. And I know there was certain ones about um, there, there might have been a certain question you were talking about about a younger coach or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I say to people out there that honestly the game. The game hasn't changed a great deal, you know. Now, there's times now where teams are playing with one centre forward and and and, and it's still there's still some in the Premier Division that are playing with two centre forwards, but a lot of them are playing with the front three. A lot of them are playing with the front one and so on. A lot of them are pressing higher. Uh, so it means you've got to be fitter. Uh, but there's still lots of things, nine times out of ten, I've always been a counter-attack man. Counter-attack man. I've always always liked good shape for my for my team i've always liked no big holes against us uh, and i've always liked to have pace up front that we're going to counter attack teams uh, and sometimes um uh, sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but i i could go and get a video now of uh, of crystal palace playing chelsea in 1976 or 70, yeah, 76 it was where chelsea had so much of the ball it was unbelievable. But then all of a sudden they lost their shape, lost the ball and we scored and it was counter-attacking. And uh, so I can assure everybody uh, the game's n- never going to change that much. Uh, it's still going to be about movement. It's still going to be about organisation uh, and it's still going to be about scoring goals and, and not conceding cheaply. No, and Peter, Peter, interestingly, though, that counter-attack approach, is that something you always believed in when you were low down the leagues, when you are starting out? Or was, something, was that something that evolved as you progressed and sort of thought, no, this is the style for me within the, you know, the elite level? Um, well, it's something that I've always, I've always believed in. I, I, for instance, for instance, if we have a corner, sorry, if we have a, uh, the opposing team have a goal kick, then that's the only time I have a front three because I don't want them playing out from the back with ease. I want them to kick it along and see what we can do from there. In open play, I like to have a solid back four or back five, whatever we're, whatever we're doing. And I, I'm very happy to encourage teams then to come out to us because then I want them to lose the ball in the halfway line. I want them to look up to see an organised 10 outfield players against them. Uh, because then they try things a little bit hard and that's when they lose the ball and that's when a counter-attack is on. Um, so it's something that I've always believed in. Now, whether it's because I was a winger, I was a fast winger when I played and and then I, you know, I know that all of a sudden, if I was at Crystal Palace, we used to win the ball and they used to get the ball out to me wide pretty quickly and then, again, played at Tottenham with Glenn Hoddle. He could pass... 100 yards just like that and uh, so he would he would attack quickly so it's maybe that just might have been something that was drawn into me uh, okay uh, that's that's interesting no yeah james over to you if there's any more questions that have come in you need to unmute yourself james so i'm muted there um, yeah we, we've got a few so maybe try and um whiz, yeah, whiz do, you, a few of these do you want to do you want to reel them off and I'll, I'll mute myself for a bit yeah 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 so um, a couple of questions. So one that we had sent through um, from someone when they were signing up um, it kind of links as well um, to a question from Andrew. Um, so Andrew said, what's the biggest mistake you've made in football coaching and how have you come back from it? Um, and Sam said, what's your biggest lesson that you've learned in football? So I guess the two are kind of into. Yeah, no, they're, both, they're, they're good ones. I, I think my, one of the biggest um uh lessons i think i've learned is that i was too happy to let good players go because i was confident enough that i was going to be the coach that will get the best out of the players that come in uh you know neil lennon going to celtic from leicester city he was you just couldn't replace him couldn't replace him but i said to myself no i'll get another midfield player uh, like that uh, but you couldn't replace his his um his character, the way he was in the changing room, his presence, he was fantastic. Um, so if anything, I, I want, I'd want people to be confident coaches, 
but don't be confident enough that's going to hurt yourself, you know. So um, if I was a technical director of the teams that I've managed and and that manager was me that come along to the technical director, I'd be saying to him, don't let them good players go because the good players always get you out of trouble and they win you a match uh, when when at times you probably shouldn't do. So, so be confident. But be realistic. You know, uh, I think that uh, you can you can definitely help a player, but you're not going to all of a sudden turn them into Lionel Messi. You know, and uh, you're going to you, you know you can help them. Uh, be be realistic on how much you can help them. And may, maybe when I first went to Leicester, I was too confident at that time as a coach that I, I don't matter. Emil Heskey went to Liverpool for 13 million, which I couldn't do nothing about. I didn't sell him. That was already done. But what I'm saying is I probably would have agreed to have done that because if that would have been good for Emil, I'd have said, yes, go and do it. But in the end, it really hurts you. And, it, and there's no doubt about it. You're the same person doing the same job, but the team are getting beat. So everybody then thinks you're hopeless, you know, which is which is difficult. Yeah, it's interesting you say about, um, you know, having having those good players um, because sort of looking sort of further back in your career in the sort of the non-league side of things. Um, we've got a question from Terence who says, in the lower leagues, how did you deal with players if they thought that they were too good to work on a certain topic? So that, that might be in training. Um, well, to be fair, thankfully, I suppose because of my background, whether it was me starting at Dartford and Enfield and, and Dagenham and Redbridge and Dover and, and things like that, uh, I didn't really have too many that disagreed with what the things that we were trying to give them, you know. Uh, but again, if that was the case and I felt as though they were upset in the changing room, I would just let people like that go. Because I think that, that, you know, if you're taking any coach out there, if you're taking a training session and 11 people are doing it right, but one's not, you're better off getting rid of that one because he's, he or she is going to mess up your session and uh, and you're better off. You'll have a better session without them. That is a sir. Uh, the thing that I'd never got across earlier is about the sessions being realistic as well. Uh, I, I just feel as though, you know, people have got to be realistic. Uh, um, all the players, I think, have always got to be tested. Every time you have that training session, test them. Don't, don't, don't let them come off that training pitch and just think, well, that, that was all right. It's just a nice little bit of ball work there or whatever. Test them. There, there's, there's certain things that you can always test them with. And, and even if it means it is a ball work session, give them some things there that are really, really difficult to do. But let, at least you're testing them. And, and I think that um, that and things are being realistic. You know, get, just get them doing things that you know is realistic to the position that they will be playing on, on the Saturday. Uh, and that will help them. That's great. And you mentioned there about the sort of those individuals and almost no individuals being being bigger than the team. Um, and Chloe's just asked us if, in your opinion, and I, I sense I kind of we, we've almost got the answer here, that is the environment more important? So managing the environment of the team more important rather than managing the individuals? Or both? Yeah, I think I think, you know, I, I... I, I, I won't tell you who, but there was a player that I let go uh, for under 21s. Um, we were playing away somewhere, and uh, and he weren't he weren't playing ball. He wasn't playing ball, and I think that he was affecting everybody. Uh, so I rang up the manager um, uh, of his team uh, and told him he went fine, send him back, whatever. Uh, and the spirit straight away, everything, everything then was was nice straight away. Very, very important, honestly. Uh, if you've got somebody, uh, um, not only I think they would let you down, uh, it, you know, if you've got somebody in the change room or on the training pitch like that, they'll let you down, they'll let the next person down as well. And uh, so I think that's where you've got to be big and strong uh, and just politely ask them to leave. And, uh, and uh, you know, don't, don't let that one individual uh, mess up your session that you've worked extremely hard to prepare for and uh, don't mess up the the other eleven and the other squads night. Great, right. I'm going to move on to some very quick far ones now. Okay. Um, so first, a question from John. What do you think holds the most weight, a university coaching degree or the coaching badges? Oh, it's not an easy one for me. I, I, <laughs> I don't want to guess. I don't want to guess the answer on that one. To be honest with you, but definitely. Um, I would say coaching badges will have more 
in that in, in, in a football club, you know, if, if a football manager saw that, maybe he might take that a bit more, um, you know, as if as if that's better. As, you know, I'm not saying it is better or not, uh, but it, it sounds better if it's league football to me. So, Peter, just uh, another question for you on a, on a slightly uh, different theme. Um, Dylan has asked us, in terms of the women's game, um, do you think there's any different opportunities or methods? I mean, I, I appreciate it might be a difficult because you've not, um, sort of coach in the women's game yourself and actually might be one for for Chloe to potentially come in come in on as well um, but in terms of the women's game um, are there are there different opportunities or methods for aspiring coaches uh, or that aspiring coaches should take to progress compared to the men's game? Um, well I, I think I think with the women's game to be honest with you there's more money more sponsorship going around because it's got it's gone so well and the and the last world cup was really enjoyable to to watch and and good to you know very good good standard as well you know so so for me if there's opportunities there uh, I, I personally would would I, I'd grab it if I was uh, anybody out there that had that opportunity I wouldn't be uh, afraid to go there to go again the things I said about going to academies um, it could be to go and watch, you know, the ladies train and, and, their, and their academies and, 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 the, uh, and so on. So uh, there's definitely opportunities. Uh, if there's opportunities there, I would, I would take them. The standards to me is getting better. Uh, and if the, if the standards got to get even, even more, then there's, there's, there's a good reason there to need a coach. And uh, so to me, that's the type of thing that, that could be available. Is it difficult yeah. though to make the transition from the women's game into the men's game, though, Peter? Is that something that you've experienced or noticed throughout your career? Well, Rob, all, all I'm saying now is that if all of a sudden I'm uh, to uh, on a training pitch now with with 20 ladies who are then going to take on a training session, I'm not convinced I'd be saying too much different on, on whatever they need for the level that they're at. You know, I don't think I'd be then saying this is. Well, this is different. We're not going to do this today. But the men do that, but you don't do that. I can't. I can't see me taking any other different session. You know, to me, straight away, I'd be saying, right, how we're going to score, and how we're not, how we, how we're not going to concede, um, and and then you 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 go over the groups of individuals, what's their strength, what's their weaknesses, and so on, so on, so on. So I don't think there's too much different. If I was to be honest with you, yeah. Uh, that's good to know because sometimes we do get feedback. Oh, you know, is it going to you know pigeonhole me into a in, into a role working in women's football? So it's good to know there is that potential for the crossover over for the crossover. The, 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 the only, the, the only me, difference, Jay. Rob. Sorry, Rob. The the only difference I see on that is strength. You know, that's about the only difference I would see at the at the, at the ladies' football and the men's football. Cool. Thanks, Peter. Um, so just uh, move on to a question from Daniel that's that's just come in. Um, so he asks, how much would match performances dictate your sessions in the week? So certain week weaknesses, for example, or would you stick to coaching your philosophy no matter what those results have been? Oh, no, 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 no. I, my, my session, if all of a sudden we are conceding uh, too cheaply um, at set pieces um, or open play um, back four back five not as a group that there'll be things that we'll be working on straight away the the, the only slight difference for my, for me at my level now uh, or oh, sorry where I've been is that the fitness coaches get involved more these days than than w before in the older days you know on a Monday you used to train hard if, if all of a sudden you uh, played poorly on the Saturday and the manager wasn't happy with his team, there's a very fair chance that he'd be saying, right, we're going to be doing this. We're going to work really hard to put this right because this wasn't good enough on Saturday. Now, all of a sudden, the fitness coaches have got involved and you don't do so much on a Monday now because they feel that 48 hours afterwards is a little bit of a dodgy time to pick up more injuries. And so that, so you're a little bit careful. Uh, but, but overall, I oh, know I can assure any coach or manager out there that's what you've got to be doing when i then say uh, in the week it's going to be two attacking sessions or two defending sessions if it means that we're not defending right that's when them them, them defending sessions come in we could be having a clean sheet that saturday and we'd still be doing a defending session but it just then be covering something else and it's just that i would never ever want to take a training session for that week 
and not do something that's that that they're gonna deal with on the Saturday because that you know I don't like giving players any excuses. Uh, and if you if you don't train on certain things, a player could easily turn around and say to you at five o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, "Well, we've never worked on that this week. We've never done it." So I I like to make sure I don't give any player an excuse. Brilliant, thank you. So um, I'm going to move on to Terence. Um, so he asks, uh, do you have any regrets as a manager, such as wishing that you'd taken on a certain job or missed out on signing a certain player? Um, well, to, if people was to look at my CV, um, then they would see that I've had a lot of jobs. Uh, I've been sacked a, quite a few times, not, not, not crazy amount of times, but, but a few times. Uh, had success. Uh, haven't had any relegations uh, as a as a coach or a manager, but to be fair, at start of seasons where we were doing poorly, I got the sack pretty early. So you know maybe it might have turned out to be a relegation, whatever. Um, but um, I'm I, I'm a, I'm a person. I'm a football man, you know. And if the phone rings and it's somebody that's looking to take you on to give you an opportunity to go on that training pitch every day and be a coach and be a manager there's a fair chance, unless for some reason it's hitting me between the eyes saying, don't do it, I'm going to take it, you know. Um, so I, I don't, there's not been too many times I've regretted turning something down because I've always took it, you know. Um, I've, uh, you know, that, that's how I am. I'm a football man, you know. I, it, it doesn't have to be a championship team for me or whatever. It, it's, it's, it's about being football about getting on the training pitch every day, being able to sign your players, uh, recruiting well and uh, winning matches. That's that's what it is. Uh, so there's not been many times I've ever turned down a fantastic opportunity to then say, well, no, I do really regret that. So that's not, that's not you know, I can't think of anything there. You know, I'm, I'm one to take it. What was the other one you said there, James? Uh, there, there was a sort of a follow up on that. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah, a second part of that, yeah, a sort of maybe a player that you've missed out on signing. Um, no, I don't think I don't think there's been any that I've missed out on. Uh, you know, when I was at Hull City, we got two promotions at Hull City, and um, we really recruited well. And not only did we recruit well to get two promotions, after I left and went to Crystal Palace as a manager. Uh, the club sold the players and made a fortune. So we, we, we recruited well. But there weren't a great deal that I could then say we missed out on. John Waters, who people might have heard of. I signed John Waters for, I think, £100,000 from Bolton. Um, and uh, he helped us get one promotion. And the start of the, um, the, start of the championship um, league at Hull, uh, when we got Hull into the championship, John come to see me to say, um, Gaffer, am I going to play? And I said, not so sure you're going to play every week. Uh, and that was because I loved him. I thought he was a great fella uh, and I wanted to help him. And I didn't want to then say, yeah, you will play. And then it gets to August and you don't play. So I told him the truth. He appreciated that. He said, would you mind letting me go? He said, I prefer to go and play lower level um, and make sure I'm playing first team football. Now I respected that because there's too many people that are in squads. They don't kick the ball and they earn a few bob. Uh, now John wanted to go and play and he played for Chester uh, and he played against Ipswich in the FA Cup and uh, he played well. Ipswich signed him and from then on, John has incredible moves to Stoke and they're all over the place. So you could say there, I made an absolute nightmare decision there. At the time, at the time at Hull, he wasn't confident in front of goal. But if it's ever going to kick you in the teeth, that one, I'm very happy that John Walt has done that to me because he was a good fella. Good fella. That's great. Well, that leads me on nicely then to a, to another another question. And obviously you've worked with some, some pretty big names. Um, who would you say is the best player that you've coached? Um, most professional, James Milner, 100%. Uh, you could not stop that ball. Well, you had to hold him down to stop him working uh, because he would be doing everything. He'd be in the gym on a Friday morning, even probably Saturday morning, knowing him before a game, you know, incredible, does everything right, eats the right stuff, drinks the right stuff, does everything right. My only criticism of James is that at times he could have been a little bit more caring on his end product. 
But apart from that, fantastic. Um, one of the best players, of, of, you know, of, 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 I've had Rio Ferdinand, I've had Frank Lampard, I've had Michael Owen, I've had Emil Heskey. You know, we spoke earlier about teams playing one up front. Emil Heskey would be unbelievable because if anybody wanted to play with a number nine, you'd want him to have a presence, which Emil's got. You'd want him to be good in the air, which Emil is. You'd want him to run towards the ball that he, and he could hold it up, which he could. You'd want somebody to stretch a team, which Emil could. So you, so you couldn't get much better than Emil. The only thing wrong with Emil is that he was too unselfish. You know, he would he would pass it to Alan Shearer and let Alan Shearer score rather than rather than Emil score. Um, so, um, yeah, so I've been very... The under-21 job I got, which I was so grateful for from Glenn Hoddle, was took some incredible players. Uh, and as I say, and the nice thing about that job... They didn't want to hang around being in under twenty ones. They they done it right because they wanted to they wanted to get promoted to the senior team because they know how much it was good for their careers. Um, but honestly, Kieran Dyer, you know, I'm I'm nicely in Kieran Dyer's book because I've always said that without his injuries, he would have been a, probably the best player I would have coached. He got so many injuries that that, that held him back. But what a, I had him as a seventeen year old playing as a left wing back uh, for the under twenty ones. What a player. Can I just mention, we mentioned about England and the players and we've, we've gone through the whole call nearly without mentioning Mr Beckham. And um, I'm sure you made him captain, didn't you? Well, I, I think they say, they say in football that the phone will possibly ring if you get seven things out of ten right, you know, and, uh, and that's what happens when you're either recruiting or making decisions or whatever. Uh, now, with David Beckham... Um, I was involved in the 98 World Cup uh, with Glenn Hoddle. I was one of his coaches. Uh, so, you know, I was involved in the build-up and was watching all the seniors train and taking certain sessions. And David always wanted to be there, you know. And, uh, he loved playing for his country. And then all of a sudden he gets sent off and he gets hammered the following year. And then I then get the opportunity when, unfortunately, Glenn goes and Glenn should never have gone. He didn't go for football reasons and he was building a tremendous team as they showed against Argentina. And then all of a sudden Glenn goes, then they have another couple of problems and Kevin Keegan takes over and then Kevin goes. And then they asked me to take the team for one game. Uh, and we was looking for a captain and uh, Gareth Southgate was in the squad. Gary Neville was in the squad and you could look at their positions and probably think, well, there's a fair chance they might have, you know, or should have been captain before David. But in the end, I knew I was, manager for one game and I knew how much he wanted to play and he was always he'd always turn up for the games he'd never he'd never have an injury he'd never throw one in he'd always be there and he got hammered the following year after the World Cup and he handled it brilliantly so I felt as though he deserved it and one thing's for sure you know I've been on that training pitch with David Beckham and he'd take 50 balls out there with him to practice his free kicks he don't you know he he does it right if he's going to take a free kick it's going to be the best free kick if he's going to be captain he'll be the best captain I, everybody knew that about him. And I, in the end, he turned out to be a really, really good captain. And he carried on playing well. Uh, there's an art of being a captain. If it doesn't affect your performance as well, then that's a that's a real plus. Yeah, because interestingly on that, I saw, obviously on these reruns, um, they, they showed recently the Argentina game. And yeah. how do you, you're obviously, you're obviously on the touchlines during that game with... Uh, with me, Glenn Hoddle, and how how do you pick up a dressing room like that after such an occasion, when they've gone out on penalties? You know they should have really won that game. I mean, how yeah. do people bounce back? How do teams bounce back from that? Yeah, no, it was tough. I've got to say, it was it was very very tough. In, and 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 I think you know that, that's the type of things in a changing room that there's there's no words. There's no words. I, I can assure you, there was more. There was there were there weren't a lot said. Uh, if anything, there would have just been a light, um, bad luck, whatever. But you know, and then we'd have got into it, <clears throat> and that was one of the problems, I suppose, is that uh, of being an England manager or being an international manager is when the game's finished, then they go home. You know, where if you're a club manager, uh, you could have spoken about that and gone over it the next day or whatever. What we done the next day was come home, simple as that. Yeah. Uh, everybody was too, I suppose, disappointed. Now Glenn would have picked it up the next time uh, the players would have met. Uh, but of course, there'd have been certain players that that wouldn't have been there because there would have been a bit of a break from the World Cup to the following August. And um, so, um, yeah, it, it was a it was a sad old night, and um, and especially sad simply because for 
for we had 10 men for a, a long long time you know probably over an hour wasn't it because it was i think it was yeah. after an hour of the game and uh, so you got another 60 minutes plus the extra time so 90 minutes there and we were better than them um, and we thought we scored a goal as well which in the end hurt us again yeah no interesting thing i just thought i'd mention that as it came up in conversation but james back to you with the questions from the coaches yeah, yeah. Um, I think we've probably uh, got time. I'll just go for a couple, couple more here, um, and then that's, we'll probably um, have to call it a day there because I'm, I'm conscious of your time, Peter. Um, so I've got a got a good question from Terence, and Terence says uh, resilience is so important in football due to the nature of the game. Uh, so what supportive measures did you have at times uh, where you left clubs yourself sooner than you wanted to, and and keeping yourself belief? Yeah, I think that's a that, that is a good question because. Um, it gets a bit lonely when you're the manager and you're getting beat and then all of a sudden you get the sack. It's a lonely old job, you know, and you've got a, you really have got to believe in yourself that you're doing the right things. Uh, you don't, of course, blame everybody else. You don't do that either. You know, there would be certain things uh, where you have done something wrong. I've done something, loads of things wrong. I'm, I've got no doubt about that. You learn from them. You, you you take stock and you then say, right, OK, what could I have done this? What could I have done that? You're desperate for your staff to be the top staff. You know, when you see managers um, completely clear out staff and take their own staff with them, early on in my career, I couldn't really understand that. Now I totally understand it because you really have got to have people that are willing not to just nod their head and agree with you. They've got to then be saying to you at times, I think you might be wrong there, Gaffer. I uh, hope you don't mind me saying it, but you might be wrong. Uh, now, as much as you might have a disagreement with a member of your staff, you still get more things cleared up that way. Um, so that's where it is a lonely old job. That's where the technical director or the director of football comes in if the manager is happy with that director of football you know i'm i'm 67 years of age now you know i really do feel as i should be director of football somewhere but you i've got to have somebody there that trusts me that's happy that i'm in the same uh, building as him because i know i would help him in certain things you know uh, and and i would also be able to pick that manager up because the team are down, the players are down, that manager's picking that, them players up, his staff are picking those players up. But when when the manager's down, there's nobody in there um, that's really, really going to help you. Uh, now, when I was manager of Hull City, uh, we had a, you know, we had two promotions at Hull City and finished off in the championship from, from 18th in League Two, which was real, real success. But there was a time at Hull City where it weren't going so well and my chairman was magnificent, a fellow called Adam Pearson. He said to me, you ain't going anywhere. We will get this right. And now little things you'd need to hear like that, and I'll give you a boost. It really does give you a boost. Uh, but there's not many times that happens when you're when things are going against you. So it's a really, really good point. That's where you've got to recruit right, and you've got to have members of your staff that you know, that you trust, that also will tell you what they think and not what you want to hear. Great, thank you. Now I've, I'm going to just for our last question go right back to the sort of almost back to the start. Um, <laughs> and we got we got a question from Dylan, um, who's a coach I think that's only worked within youth football, um, and so he wants to know um, how how someone coaching in youth football can work their way up the age groups um, into the first team, and, and whether you would say it's better to move clubs in order to take a step up, or better to kind of work your way naturally up by the age groups um again you need you need that little bit of luck dylan uh, i've got to be honest with you but if you're taking a youth team coaching uh if you're coaching a youth team every week whatever and you're building a, you know you're doing that at a club if you get a good name uh that you're you know people say well go and look at dylan's sessions you know he's he's, he's got them organized they all turn up in the proper kit they're all doing it on time uh there's little things that you can identify if it's a good session or not um then to me you don't have to move clubs to do that i don't think i think that then you could get yourself a little reputation of he's good coaching he's a good coach and then eventually you might might get that lucky break one other thing I was going to say on the coaching as well, uh, James, is that that um, equipment is also important. 
you know. Now, I was manager at, you know, lower levels, and you don't know, you don't know how, many, how many footballs you're going to get. You know, I'm manager of England, and you've got as many footballs as you like. Too many, too many. Um, so, but all I would say now is that, that and, and I don't expect anybody just to keep spending money, whatever, but if I was a youth coach now, I would make sure that I personally had the balls, had the bibs, and had some equipment. Now, I'm, I know it might cost some money, but I tell you what, and I've got to make the sessions better. Uh, and if you could afford to do that, I'm, and I've got, I've got no doubt in my mind, a lot of people already do that, already do that. Fantastic. But that then I'll make it, you know, you could be a really, really good coach. You turn up with two horrible balls and one flat ball and no no bibs and you know and and people have got to take their shirts off and all things like that it messes up everything you know so if there's any way you can possibly do things like that or make the agreement who you're working with or going to going to take a session uh, then I, I think that will make you look more professional the session will be more professional and so on that's brilliant. And sort of on those lines of sort of investing in yourself, I mean, Rob, I'll, I'll sort of hand back to you just sort of in terms of Sporting Connect. Um, just maybe you can just give a brief explanation of, of how that could benefit coaches working in the grassroots game. Yes, yeah, thanks for that, James. I won't keep people too long, so I know it's been a long call. But essentially, yeah, Sporting Connect, we're all about trying to help improve access to opportunities within all levels of football, whether it's the grassroots or the professional game. Um, we we know it's hard when you're coaching and when you're trying to stay on top of the latest opportunities that get released by clubs. Sometimes we see them, they're only actually live for one or one or two days. Um, so we try and help our coaches make sure we share those opportunities with them so you don't miss out. Um, effectively, you can save time. So you're, you're focusing what you do best as a coach. Um, we recently partnered with Surrey FA and we've we developed a network which aims to actually improve opportunity to grassroots coaches as well within the county of Surrey. Um, so we're encouraging any clubs of all levels. You do have roles and you want to um, post them for free onto the Surrey FA, Surrey, Surrey FA Connect website. We'll repost them. We'll market those roles and try and get the right sort of candidates for your role. I um, mean, if you're a coach looking for opportunities and looking to stay up to date, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, and as I say, we're really passionate about trying to improve access to opportunities. And aside from the network and the website, the online stuff we do, sessions like this with Peter are really invaluable. I know we've had over 100 people in this call. And what's very difficult is the fact that we've got coaches across all levels of the game. And as I say, it's hard to then focus in one area. But hopefully everyone's come away from today and taken some real valuable insight from Peter and his experiences. And just want to say a massive thank you, Peter, really giving up the time this evening, um, answering a range of different questions and um, just really giving something back to, to help these, you know, these coaches because we, we all know we've, we're doing a really good job coaching, trying to make a difference to our lives, but also the, the players that we work with. So thanks a lot on behalf of everyone from Sporting Connect and I'm sure that Surrey Fay, I don't know if Sally or James, you want to also say something? Yeah, no, just echo echo what Rob says there. I mean, I think it's an ins inspirational story. I, there's not there's not many coaches that have worked their way up the, the sort of the ladder as you have uh, from the grassroots all the way to to the very top of the game. So, so um, thanks for sharing your story and and hopefully for a lot of people on the call today, um, it is inspirational. Um, you know, it, it's it's doable. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be your ambition, but. Um, you, you sort of proved, proved that it's doable and obviously had a fantastic career in the game. So, um, you know, thanks. Yeah, no, thanks James, for, for me, as I say, you know, I'm, a, I'm much older now, of course, but hopefully there'd be certain coaches out there that would have gained something from from tonight. I hope, hopefully they have. You know, I really do hope, hope that. I wish them good luck. Uh, please work as hard as they possibly can. Keep, keep thinking, even at times you have half hours to yourself right down the little training session or little things like that that you think you can help and uh, so uh, good luck to everybody there and um, yeah hope, uh, hope everybody stays safe that's the most important thing in a minute one final thing Peter I wanted to ask you said about the highs and lows and experience the, the success the highs of the success and the lows of the real lows as you progress through to a high level do they get worse those lows <laughs> well, low. well they're on yeah it, it, um, I'm, a, I'm a terrible loser, I can assure you. So I don't like losing, but um, but uh, I think that just got to make you more determined. That you know, that's yeah. thankfully, thankfully on Saturday night, I'm 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 the worst company ever. But by <laughs> Sunday, 
Yeah. I've recovered. And then I'm then going to get the, get the team playing like Real Madrid the following week. <laughs> no, brilliant. Well, no, thanks a lot, Peter. So much appreciated from everyone, I think, that, that attended. And um, no, thanks a lot for your insight. Pleasure to all. Good luck.